good afternoon everybody respected uh, dr vg vaidya managing trustee of lokmanya hospital all the eminent faculty my friends delegates from all over india it's absolute pleasure to have this meeting it is quite a specific meeting and uh, i think it's a first attempt to highlight the role of technology in the field of arthroplasty which is growing day by day so uh, in this i'm going to actually take you through what are the developments in field of arthroplasty in nutshell and then try to kick start this meeting so all, all of us know that uh, total knee replacement uh, knee replacement you know is one of the most successful surgeries in uh, last few decades thanks to stalwarts and teachers who have actually made this surgery very successful but today for our terminally arthritic patients total knee replacement is not the only choice and we have spectrum of uh, surgeries to offer to our needy patients like total knee unicompartmental bicompartmental patellofemoral now the bicruciate retaining knees etc and so the spectrum goes on it's one of the most successful surgeries but still many of our patients are not at the end of the day happy almost various series in the literature if you see then about 20 to 25% of patients are still not happy they may be painless but they are not happy and all of us have experienced that and that may be due to the recovery the limitations of activities unmet expectations and the main thing is that the knee doesn't feel normal so we need to address that even unicompartmental knee arthroplasty is also one of the great you know is a great surgery actually and properly selected patients and properly done uk the results are really really very good but it is quite hard to get a, a unicompartmental knee uh, in a perfect alignment i always say that there are three advances in uh, joint replacement the tools that means our implants are improving designs materials a lot of research has gone into that there are techniques like mis techniques the cruciate retaining the unicompartmental the technology like navigation handled navigation tools like ortholine and now the robotics so all these three t's are taking the science of arthroplasty to the next level the mainly if we see where is where can be the scope for improvement in the outcome there can be two variables one is the implant design and secondly is the accuracy of implantation now there are so many implants being developed but globally if you see the literature not you know significant improvement in the factors which are actually giving our patients that sort of dissatisfaction that is not improving and so there has to be second component which has to be thought over very very you know deeply so accuracy of implantation depends on so many variables so there are you know surgeon's perception then uh, pre operative planning how do you calculate the center of head we put the intramedullary jig and uh, take say 5 mm 5 degrees or 6 degrees whether that is correct whether there were errors in calculating that and what impact is going to be on the ultimate mechanical axis or ultimate uh, alignment of the knee remains to be actually studied obesity all these short obese patients when i am sure everybody you know sometimes uh, in the night i get up with a dream of such a patient you know next day and it's so difficult to put a implant right in these kind of patients who's short obese type lacks knees so there are so many patient variables also so there are you know a lot of variables which are going to affect our ultimate results if we see the variables which are going to have, you know affect our ultimate alignment there are certain things like patient factors which we discussed the second is the femoral side we have to calculate the exact center of the femoral head the femoral implant flexion extension all three planes uh, flexion extension varus valgus and uh, the, then the depth of the cut everything all are variable and they are dependent on manual as well as they are dependent on the instruments uh, uh, you know instrumental or jigs also so there are almost 6 7 variables on the femoral side similarly on the tbl side also there are many variables and if we just uh, try to do permutations and combinations there are infinite i think possibilities where in spite of a skilled surgeon they can go off track i may not say wrong but off track and then there are these uh, align this uh, various things can go wrong in uk things become even difficult difficult and uh, because there are you know not many landmarks there and so there are these variables which become very difficult to tackle 
And so we sometimes see all these disastrous X-rays. Sometimes the disaster may not be so obvious, but over a period these knees wear out and there are chances of early uh, sort of um, uh, revision. We all have been taught that total knee replacement is not a bony surgery, it is a soft tissue surgery. We all tell, you know, in one of the meetings in Dubai, my friend Dr. Ali is there and one of the senior surgeons uh, asked us when we were on the panel, I've done many grotesque deformities and I did not see a need of uh, a tool. I said, it's very humbly, sir, we have also done a lot of uh, grotesque deformities, bad cases, but where is the evidence? Whatever soft tissue release you did, whether it was correct or optimum or not, that is point number one. And at the end of the day, what did you give to your students? You know, they may, might have observed you, but whether there is any objective number or objective criteria which is going to define our surgery as optimum or it is just, I think it is like that. And as a student or assistant, we have to say yes to our boss. So that is the way it has been going on. So I think there can be some role of science to make these releases, make these cuts more objective. So why don't we take care of the science, take help of the science? So recent uh, advances have been, you know, perfect alignment, but may most important is that having a kinematic alignment. And after robotics, now two years of practicing that, I have learned a lot from this system. There are other things like patient match technology, which came and did not have a very big impact on arthroplasty. Computer navigation also was there, and uh, it, it, it uh, came as a very popular modality and then uh, went again into some sort of, uh, you know, slow mo movement on that side. But if you see the long-term research now, computer navigation, there's a lot of evidence in the literature saying that people who have undergone navigated knee replacement have got better results, long-term results. So there is definitely, again, now it is getting revived. Handled robotics are there. So what if we have a system which is going to help us in alignment in all three planes, gives us a good kinematic alignment, and gives us appropriate gaps and balancing in all degrees of motion, not only in 90 degrees flexion and in extension. So entire range of motion, so probably we will be able to you know, address the so-called issues of mid-flexion instability. So th there is a need of a system in my opinion. Now let's see what is a robot, because when I started, uh, you know, purchased it, the first question my uh, son, who was a small kid at, in seventh standard, he asked me, Baba, now you are going to be idle now, the robot is going to do the operation, so what are you going to do now? So, you know, that kind of reaction comes from a lot of uh, common people, the patients also, <clears throat> so what is going to happen? So actually it is, I'm going to cover what are the types of robots. So robot uh, term came from Polish word robota, which means forced labor. And it is a machine which is one programmable by computer capable of carrying out complex series of actions automatically. It is a term used to describe a machine that carries out multiple tasks automatically or with minimal external impulse, especially that is programmable. So again, robot can be a humanoid robot or it can be non-humanoid. There are some robots which look like a human being because patients, when we are taking them in OT, ask where is the robot, and when we show the computer and the machine, they say this is not a robot. So they have, we have to know that the robot may not be exactly looking like a human. That is one type of robot which is generally used in a non-healthcare things like, you know, various things. This uh, Sophia was in news for a lot of time some days back. So uh, if you see the history of development of robots in uh, uh, orthopedic surgery, the applications, it goes long back. Actually, the first medical application was for CT-guided brain biopsy way back in 1988. Probot was in, uh, developed in Imperial College of London for prosthetic surgery. Robodoc was the first uh, machine you, or robo used for hip replacement in 1992. Now, we can have three types of robots, that is active, passive, and semi-active or semi-haptic, which have tactile feedback mechanism and require surgeon's role uh, and surgeon's involvement to manipulate the robotic arm. So let's see what are the active systems. They are capable of performing individual tasks automatically, though the role of surgeon is not there. Unfortunately, these came and they had some disastrous uh, outcomes where there was no tactile sorts of feedback to them. And so they did not understand what is the strength of bone, whether there is osteoporosis or not. And then there were some on-table disasters. And so they have now actually not been in uh, uh, use anymore to a great extent. Passive system is like a computer navigation which stands in a corner. It tells what is to do, but it doesn't participate in surgery. So it is not in action. 
And present day, whatever we are using in arthroplasty are semi-automatic or semi-haptic robots. And they work on the principle of virtual reality. That virtual reality thing is a very important and a very interesting concept. Virtual reality is an interactive computer-generated experience. Means you can see here the replica of the femur is being created intraoperatively, so there is nothing left to imagination. And I am sure all the eminent faculty is going to show you in two days what are the various ways we can use this concept of vir virtual reality. And actually there is nothing actually left to imagination and we can make the difficult surgery look very simple. So uh, there are three things uh, in a semi-active or semi-haptic robot. There is mapping or planning, then the milling or sculpturing. The surgical actions are constrained or adjusted by system. Final control is with the surgeon, but the system also has an intelligence. That means the surgeon, if he does some gross, uh, say, uh, uh, mapping, for example, so he uh, points the medial malleolus at one point and tries to, you know, uh, mark the lateral malleolus somewhere weird uh, spot, then it, the computer will not accept. So there is some sort of intelligence uh, in the system as well. So now first generation in the semi-haptic, they were first generation like Mecoplasty, which is a city-based, and that uh, they were quite expensive. There were denials from the insurance and other things with that. Radiation hazards were there. And so first generation are being used. Meco is one of the popular things, but now the Navio, that is the present robot which me and many of our faculty members are using now, is a second generation robotic assisted system which is image free. We don't require any CT scan or MRI or anything like that. It is a handheld robotic arm or instrument. We have uh, three steps, intraoperative registration, mapping, planning and then execution. That is, we sculpture the bone and these are the three steps in which we do that. This was developed at Carnage Institute, Robotic Institute. So this is how it looks. Uh, we have uh, uh, various you know, uh, applications on that which we'll be studying. This is the handpiece, and it has got two controls, that is exposure and speed control. I am sure that this are going to be discussed in coming days. And now if we see how the interest in the you know, industry is, then I was surprised to have this reference that there are almost 159 surgical robotic systems are being developed. That's a huge number. So, Anybody tries to develop something where there is going to be a demand or a need, and every, every industry, you know, they develop the instruments based on the need, and that's, it, that's going to be the need, and that's it, that is going to be the way forward. So there is going to be a lot of uh, talk about this in coming years. I was always, you know, whenever I went to various conferences, uh, people said there's a new technique, where is the evidence, and then I just, uh, thanks to this event today, I went back to the library and uh, got some reference, and I found loads of references coming up, you know, you can see all uh, indexed reputed journals where they are saying for unicompartmental, as well as for, uh, you know, total knee systems, it is actually within three years, the results have been absolutely amazing, the even things like post-operative pain, the outliers have been actually completely marginalized, less than 1%. So the accuracy part is coming in picture. There are a lot of papers like that I could find. You can see one of the papers which I'll show here, the, you know, the pain score, it was 55% lower than the conventional knee replacement. So that's, that's really uh, significant. There are many cadaveric studies for accuracy and all of us know that you need to implant or put the implant in absolutely accurate position. If you don't do that, then the knee is not going to you know, last long. So I'm not going to read every paper, but I found loads of uh, you know, uh, references for robotic surgery. Some of, most of them are uh, to the handheld robotic tool, that is the uh, Navio. Some of them are for MECO, but ultimately robotic uh, science is here to stay. And uh, again, I welcome you all for this exciting meet. And so let's begin and uh, let's try to explore this new area of uh, uh, surgery. Thank you very much and again welcome.